Welcome everybody to this MGAA briefing uh, on senior managers regime. Um, first of all, housekeeping issues. We're not expecting a fire drill. If the alarm continually sounds, please leave the building immediately using the nearest fire exit. It's either here or there is one upstairs. Um, and follow instructions from the designated fire marshals. And the central muster point is the Aviva Plaza. Uh, this event qualifies for an hour of CII CPD, and the event will be podcast afterwards, so we are recording. Uh, I'd like to welcome Gavin Stewart, who's an associate director with Grant Thornton. Uh, Gavin joined Grant Thornton in 2016 after 27 years working in regulation, Bank of England, FSA, FCA, formerly the FCA's chief risk officer. Uh, Gavin's been focusing on SMCR since the FCA CP was published in July last year and worked with firms across several sectors and publishes regular blogs about SMCR on LinkedIn, which I'm sure you're all uh, following, um, the last of which was about Jess Daly's uh, recent fine. Um, over to Gavin. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming. Um, there we go. Right. So um, these are learning objectives. What I'm going to try and do is talk around the slides rather than go through them. Um, you'll see if you've had a look that some of them have a reasonable amount of detail in. I hope you find that useful for reference. Um, as I say, what I'm going to try and do is talk around them, give you a little bit of context, a little bit of background, uh, and on the way through as well, hopefully a little bit of a sense of how I think the FCA is going to regulate this when it comes in. Um, but obviously, please feel free to uh, ask questions on the way through. Um, there will obviously be time at the end, and uh, Mark's here and will help me. Um, answer some of those uh, some of those questions then um, what I'd like to do before we start out um, is really get a gauge of where um, where you think you are in terms of knowing about SMCR so if you could take a, a little bit of a show of hands of either you know nothing about it a little bit about it a reasonable amount or you spent a lot of time could I just get a, maybe a bit of feel who, who knows nothing about this who's this is a greenfield site. Okay, fine. A little bit. Okay, reasonable amount and a good deal. Okay, that's probably what I thought. It was sort of in the middle. Um, part, of the, um, part of the background to all this is that this is a very long, slow burn. So this starts really with the failure um, of the regulators to find a way to hold senior people to account during the crisis. Um, we'll come on to this a little bit more. You then have the Parliamentary Commission on Banking Standards, then you have SMR coming in for banks and insurers in March 2016, and then we'll talk about the time frame for this on the way through. So it's been on the agenda for quite a while. Um, look across. The other thing about it that I think it's worth saying up front is that actually this isn't the kind of what you see is what you get piece of regulation. Um, the trick to all this is understanding um, why it's turned up, um, why it's turned up in the form it's in, um, and what it's going to feel like down the line, so post-implementation as well as pre, because a lot of the burden is going to come after that date in 2019 rather than before, um, and also what it means as and when you have some kind of conduct failure and the FCA comes to call or you're part of a thematic piece of work and so on, because that's really what it's about. So it, it's, not, it's not about compliance as such in terms of a kind of tick box piece of regulation. This is about understanding why it's there and when it's going to get hot. So this only arises because Parliament um, and the media and the public generally were dissatisfied with various aspects of how the regulator was able to act during the crisis. Um, and so when there is another crisis, when there is another failure, that's when the spotlight will, will be, um, will be um, most bright. Contents in a little bit more detail. So we will go through the, um, the main features of the regime um, and look at how it interlocks um, the different parts of it. 
Um, we'll talk a little bit about how we got here, the, the overall context that I've just referred to, but also the, um, the way in which the FCA is using it as part of its new culture approach. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit more about um, uh, what implementation is likely to feel like and what you should, what you should be looking for on the way through. Okay, so um, main features. This is, um, this is how I tend to think about it. Um, and it reflects the fact, I think, that the, the certification regime, even though it gets much less in the way of headlines, is arguably um, the bulk of what will change. So there is a sense in which the senior manager regime is a, a rebooted version of approved persons. It has more teeth, which we'll come on to. Um, but the certification is something that actually falls to firms. There's an element of transfer of risk from the regulator to firms. So they're responsible for many fewer people under the senior manager's regime than under the old approved persons. But some of those old approved persons become certified staff plus a chunk of other people, almost certainly. Um, and the administration of that and all that it involves um, actually is quite significant. Um, and then the conduct rules are really the foundations of the whole thing. So the individual ones are very wide in their, in their scope. Um, and the senior conduct rules, well, again, we'll talk about this in more detail, but the senior conduct rules are really what makes the senior manager regime bite. They're what makes it different from the old approved person's regime. Or at least that's the intention. So um, these are the main changes. So as we've said, the senior manager functions um, uh, and certified staff replace the old approved person's regime. The total number of people is likely to be much greater. Um, but the number who have to be approved by the FCA significantly smaller. Um, one of the key differences is prescribed responsibilities. Um, we'll talk about these in a little bit more detail, but they're quite interesting in that they typically involve um, individual executives, sometimes the chief executive, but, but usually not, taking responsibility for things that affect the whole of the firm. So there's an element in which it cut, cut, they cut across um, conventional reporting lines, conventional responsibility lines. So actually thinking about how they fit into your culture um, is an important part of this. Um, all of these things uh, essentially need to be put together in a statement of responsibility and for each senior manager they need to have one of these and they need to be submitted to and approved by the FCA. So that if you like is your your documented list of what you're on the hook for, potentially. Um, and for enhanced firms, um, if you add all those up, it needs to cover all the firm's activities and functions. Um, even if you're not enhanced, to be honest, I would recommend that you think about it in that way, because I think if there are significant activities or functions that aren't covered by a senior manager, then actually that probably raises questions. And I suspect that in practice, if the supervisor comes in a supervisory capacity, they probably, they're probably expect that in the real world. Um, if you get to enforcement, it will shift back again. But in the normal run of supervisory life, I think they would expect firms to have all their main bases covered. Um, as I say, the individual conduct rules, they are very wide. They apply to um, almost everyone. Um, except, um, as I say, define categories like receptionists and cleaners and so on, but, but essentially um, everyone involved in the financial business of your firm is caught by this. Um, I think it's also fair to say we'll have to wait for the final rules to come out, but where you have financial business that's not regulated, I would be quite careful about just assuming that it's it's somehow hived off and it won't be caught by this in some shape or form. Um, talked about this, talk about the senior manager conduct rules later. Um, and then we get into um, some of the administration of this. So there are more enhanced um, fit and proper assessments. Um, there is a requirement to capture and report on conduct rule breaches. Um, and there is a requirement to start compiling regulatory references, which will need in due course to go back six years. 
So this isn't retrospective. So when it comes in, that will be day one. But in six years' time, you'll be expected to have systems that cover six years' worth of regulatory references, to ask for those when you recruit people, to supply them when people move on to work somewhere else. So as I say, the burden of this, you can imagine that's much bigger potentially for certified staff than it, and potentially more complex um, than it is for the senior manager population. So that is where quite a lot of the, um, the systems, the administration, the way it affects your appraisal processes, your performance reviews and so on, that's really where this sort of stuff starts to kick in and have teeth. Um, and then uh, if you talk about the, at the bottom, you talk about reasonable steps, this refers to the senior manager conduct rules. Um, and this is really where the, um, the difference um, properly starts to bite. So what the regime does is essentially individualizes things that have previously mostly operated at a firm level. Um, and it basically puts more responsibility, more onus on the individuals. This is another way of looking at it. So you have, uh, for those who are more visually minded, um, the senior manager regime is actually proportionally many fewer people than that and conduct staff proportionally many more. Um, but hopefully you get the idea. Um, this is part of the FCA's attempt to make it proportionate. Actually, they can only really do that in terms of the um, the different scopes of the regime, which we'll come on to in a second, but um, they've had some scope here and they've made the most of it. So they have worked very hard at that, but the, the ability they have to do it, given the parliamentary, the parliamentary legislation, is actually fairly slim. Um, and this is briefly how firms are caught. So there's three main categories, limited, core, and enhanced. Willis is an obvious example of an enhanced firm, and that's, and that's why it's enhanced, because it's over that threshold. Um, one of the things that we fed back on during the consultation period was that a lot of firms that we'd been talking to um, were ostensibly core, but for one reason or another um, were interested in some of, the, um, some of what the enhanced regime brought. So that might be because actually they were core at the moment, but in two or three years' time, um, through growth, they would become enhanced or they were part of a group that had an enhanced firm in it and it made sense, it was just simpler for them to do it one way across the group or because they were just below the threshold and actually that was how they ran themselves. Um, so there are a variety of different ways of looking at it. We understand the SCA is going to take, um, going to introduce something that allows some form of opt-up if people really want to do it. Um, so I think it's something it's worth considering, as I say, if you think you're going to be um, go through the enhanced threshold for one reason or another over the next few years. This is where you can see some of the difference. Again, this is the FCA trying to be proportionate. Um, so lots of enhanced senior manager functions, um, only six core ones. Uh, so one of the things you need to think about is, you know, what what status does your, if you're a core firm, what status does your chief risk officer have within the firm? Um, what status does, you know, wh where does your uh, chief operations officer sit? How does it all work together? Are these people at the same level? Um, does, it, does it help or hinder the way you run yourself as an organization? And these are the prescribed responsibilities. So again, there's there are a lot that are, you know, there's twice as many for enhanced firms as there are for, um, for core ones. Uh, although the enhanced ones, as you can see, they go down to a, um, basically they're about specific functions, about specific things that the FCA expects large firms to do in a kind of organized and coherent way. Um, whereas the core ones tend to be about over respons overall responsibility for different parts of the regime. Uh, so if you think about it, if you think about performance by the firm of its obligations under the certification regime, um, the person who has that as a prescribed responsibility actually will need to have some authority all the way across the firm. So quite often that will be the chief executive. <coughs> 
um, in which case it's simpler. If it isn't, then um, it becomes more difficult. There's obviously an HR element in there, um, but the director of HR essentially can't hold these responsibilities because of the way that it's set up. And again, you can have a look through. So this is what happens on a, um, on a sort of an annual basis. So there's an annual certificate that, um, where you have to say who's, you know, you have to certify that you're happy with the conduct and competence of people holding certified roles. Um, the FCA has tried to define what those roles are um, as tightly as they can. I think one of the things, and I'll say a bit more about this later, one of the things we'd recommend is that actually you try and take them at their word. There were instances with the banks where um, they drew these lines incredibly widely um, and they ended up with, I heard one where they ended up with a whole trading floor being certified because they all had access to a particular terminal um, that allowed them to do something on behalf of the firm. Um, I wouldn't recommend that. I think it's, it's just creating problems for you down the road. Um, so I think it is worth thinking about that. It's worth trying to make it as consistent as possible across your firm. Uh, it might, when you start looking at it in detail, it might bring out some anomalies that you want fixing. It might bring out some anomalies that you want to keep because, um, because they work for you. Um, but it is one of those things that's worth thinking about. Uh, it potentially changes the nature of your appraisal discussions and your performance reviews. Um, it might make them, give them a bit more edge, potentially at one extreme, make them slightly more adversarial. Uh, the nature of references will be very important. Um, striking that balance correctly down the line, I think, will be, um, will be interesting and difficult. Uh, and here are the conduct rules. Uh, so they all apply to senior managers. Um, the five on the left apply to, as we said, almost everyone. On one level, they're very straightforward. Um, there's not a lot that you would disagree with. Uh, it's, worth it's worth noting that actually um, Jess Daly was caught under rule two of the individual conduct rules due, sk due uh, skill, care, and diligence. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's less of a straightforward SMCR case than it might have been. So it's not a senior conduct manager rule. But nonetheless, it was, it, it's interesting to see how, how, that, how that kind of played out. Um, on the senior conduct side, um, there's a lot about reasonable steps. Now, I've been told from what I can work out that the, the standard of reasonable steps actually doesn't change um, from before. So there's quite a lot of case law around what reasonable steps actually means. I'm um, going back through previous uh, FSA cases and FCA ones. Um, so that still holds, but obviously it will play out in a slightly different context. Okay, um, so how do we get here? Um, as I said, this does have a long gestation. So this is now 10, you know, this goes back 10 years now. Uh, so this goes back to the autumn of um, 2000 and, uh, 2008 when, uh, you know, Lloyds took over HBOS and various other things happened. RBS hadn't yet um, publicly got into trouble, but they'd actually just bought um, their bit of uh, ABN AMRO. Um, that was a 2009 problem. Um, but this goes back, as I say, 10 years. So it's worth putting in a little bit of context. So this isn't the first time that the regulator has tried to hold people to account. When the FSA was set up um, in 1998, um, a key part of it was the approved persons regime. So you had new regulator for the new millennium, which I suspect hardly anyone will remember. Um, but there is quite a lot in there. Uh, and there were lots of reasons why the approved persons regime didn't succeed. Some of those were down to the um, specific uh, circumstances of specific situations. And we've yet to see whether actually the senior manager and conduct regime will be, sorry, senior manager certification regime will be any better in those specific 
circumstances in those specific situations. Some of it also actually is about the priority and the resources that the FCA puts towards um, operating this properly. So there's something about how much time and effort do they put into looking at the, at the certificates that firms submit, how much time and effort and senior attention do they put into um, senior managers, new senior managers being appointed and into each case and so on that comes along. Um, there's the language also from the Parliamentary Commission on banking standards. Um, so it's worth having a look back at that if you're in any doubt as to the, the, the sort of the strength of feeling um, that, this, uh, that this, this originates from. There's some really quite passionate, angry language in there. You only have to read the executive summary. It kind of jumps out at you. Um, but that's really where it comes from. Now, part of my, if you like, caution about the regime as a whole is that what effectively has happened here is that something that was designed to deal with a problem in, let's say, half a dozen major banks during the crisis has morphed into um, a massive scope that covers every regulated firm. Uh, it's done that in a number of, uh, over a number of different steps, um, but it still seems to me as a formal, regu formal regulator quite a significant piece of scope creep um, with not a lot of solid evidence that actually what may well be a good idea for major clearing banks um, is automatically a good idea for everyone else as well. Uh, so I think it's, it's worthwhile thinking about the impact this potentially has on your culture because your culture, the culture of your sector of all the other sectors who are caught by this now will be very different um, from the one that existed in banks 10 years ago. Um, and therefore there are likely to be some unintended consequences along the way. It doesn't mean it's negative, but it does mean that there might be some surprises. Um, and then I think also it's worth having a look at, this is Andrew Green's report. So the, um, the FSA and then turned into the PRA because it took so long to produce, uh, did a regulatory failure report into what happened to HBOS. Uh, the Treasury Select Committee then insisted that the chapter on enforcement, which is much, most relevant to this, um, was written by an independent QC, Andrew Green, um, and that was the essence of the judgment that he made. He does go on to say that actually it was made in the context of lots of very stressed and busy people, you know, working all hours trying to sort out all sorts of problems simultaneously. And again, that comes back to how different might this actually be when push comes to shove. And we won't really know until we end up in quite a stressed situation um, and see how everything pans out in reality. Um, and then, as I said, talk about how the FCA's chosen to use it. So on the whole, the rhetoric is a bit mixed, but on the whole, the FCA has slightly done played so far the enforcement angle to this. And instead, they've um, attempted to place it as at the center of their new approach to um, improving firm culture. So as I say, that that approach to firm culture has been through several iterations over the years. Um, and, uh, and this is the latest one. Um, it has a range of different implications in terms of SMCR. So as I say, on the one hand, it means that they don't see it um, wholly or in some ways primarily as an enforcement tool which is arguably what it was meant to be um, when it was born in 2013. Um, it does, however, mean that uh, they will seek to use it far more broadly, I think, than, again, it was necessarily intended to be used. So I think you'll find increasingly that every new piece of regulation that comes in, uh, firms will be expected to be clear about which senior manager has responsibility for its implementation and for its and for continued compliance and how that actually works across the different lines of defense. Um, 
and also that when they come in to see you, whether it's a routine visit, whether it's um, a thematic visit or whatever, um, they will expect the people they see to be able to talk about their responsibilities but in a cultural, in quite a broad context rather than about specific incidents the whole time. There will be a much broader um, assumption that actually senior managers are all over the culture of the activities and functions for which they're responsible. And here's a little bit more, I won't go into this in detail, but this is probably worth having a look at again. Andrew Bailey's speech from just over a year ago um, is, was really that cultural relaunch. Um, so it talks about a number of things, um, has two or three different uh, themes to it, but uh, SMCR was, was one of the major ones. Um, and again, I think it's probably worth saying here that the, the FCA is looking for, for things that it can measure, things that it can compare against what other firms do. Sometimes that won't give them a very easy answer to interpret because firms tend to do these things quite differently, even firms that ostensibly the FCA would put in the same peer group quite often have a different approach um, to, to the, same, the same type of problem. Uh, but they will be looking for relevant MI, evidence that boards have talked about some of these things, the context in which they've talked about them and so on. So actually having your own, we'll talk about this in a minute, but having your own story, proper, um, authentic story straight in your head whenever you talk to the regulator about this is actually quite, quite key to the whole thing. Um, so implementation, uh, this is in a sense part of a broader discussion about how do you see regulation and how does it fit with the normal run of business that you would do if the regulator didn't exist. Um, if you can uh, detach yourself to that extent. Um, one of the things I see more broadly, and I think it's inevitable in lots of ways because of the way that regulation has developed over the last 10, 15, even 20 years, um, is that it becomes a series of, you know, cabs off the rank where firms end up implementing them in sequence. Um, what tends to get missed in that, and to be honest, the regulators miss it too, uh, is that actually all these things aren't really in isolation. Most of them are either some, to some extent, a newer version of something they've done before, or they have an impact on the things that come just before or after. So quite often you see it, you see it um, writ large with the financial crisis and the regulatory response to that over the last decade. There are a lot of regulations that ostensibly are standalone, but actually they deal with the same, in part with the same issue, but in a slightly different way. They've been drafted by slightly different people. They might come from a slightly different origin. Um, but essentially, there's lots of overlap. And so trying to see these things in a broader context, trying to understand the aggregate impact of them and how it fits with what you would do anyway as a firm um, is A, really difficult, but actually, if you can get it right, it's really important. It allows you to both strip away quite a lot of the cost, but also actually to um, be ahead of the curve in quite a fundamental way when you're talking um, when you're talking to the FCA. And it's not always a case of, you know, matching the individual rules and just seeing whether the wording is right and whether the, the tick box compliance bit happens. Some of that needs to happen anyway, but this is more about understanding the, the purpose in behind and how they overlap and how they hopefully reinforce each other. This is my attempt to kind of produce three simple ways of, of sort of testing um, yourselves about, you know, is this really going to work? Um, so I think if you get your implementation right, it ought actually to reflect how your firm operates normally. So a, a lot of the banks ended up, um, I've heard, you know, a lot of the banks ended up creating a responsibilities map that ostensibly 
produce lots of senior manager functions that fitted together. Um, but essentially, I think they were, they, they got it over the line. They managed to implement on time. And I think there's a sort of a, there's a, a gap between that and the reality of how they sometimes operate, how they quite often operate in practice. And I think that's been refining itself out over the, the two year period since. Um, I think there's also something about can you really explain it to someone external? Um, I mean, to be honest, I would have had trouble explaining how the FSA worked at times to people who worked outside. There are some quite complex matrix operations that happen within the regulator. Sometimes you need to have people from six different areas in the room before you can make a decision. Uh, that's quite hard to explain externally. SMCR is part of its purpose is to force people to simplify what they, what they do if it's beyond a certain level of complexity. So I think what a reasonable test is when you've actually been through all this and you've produced your responsibility map, you've divided up all your senior manager functions, it, you know, can you explain that to someone external in a way that they could readily understand? Could you do it now? Um, and then the third one is, which goes back to the, you know, where this comes from, this ultimately is designed to kick in in crisis situations when there's been a conduct failure, when something's gone wrong. So no matter how good your day-to-day -day business as usual operations are, um, when you need to escalate, when something has gone wrong, does the does the responsibilities, does the accountabilities map hold up in those circumstances? So do the right people get told at the right time, potentially in the right order? Um, and I think that's quite a test for most organizations, actually, in terms of what happens. What happens if someone's not in the office for whatever reason? It's a Friday. Someone's out of the country traveling. How does that all work? Um, because those are the sorts of situations where this is going to become most acute. You might be lucky and it will never happen to you, but actually I think the nature of the industry we're in means that you know, things do go wrong and, and part of the skill is what you, how you deal with them, how you mitigate them when they do, how you sort it out. Um, so being able to explain that I think is a really critical test um, for the success of your implementation. Right, so... Um, and these are broader things that I suppose I've seen um, across regulatory change uh, programs over the years. Um, the first one I think is reasonably, I've seen, I couldn't count the number of times when um, the frontline business um, is very happy for operations, HR, whatever, to do something until really quite close to implementation. And then they start turning up at the committee meetings and they don't, you know, quite often they've been invited, but they haven't shown, or sometimes they've, they've sent someone um, along as an alternate, but who can't speak for their part of the business. Um, they wake up to something quite late that they don't like, um, and you end up with lots of expensive last minute changes along the way. This is really, really not that sort of thing. So this is, this is entirely the sort of regulatory change where you really need the executive and the board to sort, it, sort out in their own minds up front how they want to come out the far end of it. Then you can do a lot of the heavy lifting and so on through operations and, and bits and pieces. But unless, unless this fits with your strategy in terms of how, how fast you think you're going to grow, um, whether you've got any merger and acquisition stuff in mind, et cetera, et cetera. How does it fit with your culture? Are you happy with your committees and reporting lines being mucked around with? And so on. There are various ways of doing this, but if you don't decide at the top how you want to end up afterwards, then I think you're storing problems up for later in the day. Um, the second one, I think, is really about, um, so certification is really the test of this. So this is about the difference between day one and then being able to sustain something over time in a way that doesn't 
um, doesn't lead to excessive cost. So it's about, for example, getting your certification population really quite tight and as consistent as possible, um, getting the system sorted, getting them as efficient as you can. Um, uh, it's about thinking about business change, thinking about the ch any changes to appraisals and um, performance management. Uh, if you can uh, introduce the changes that SMCR will bring uh, in a way that aligns them with uh, things you're going to do anyway. So if you can bring it in, if you can bring the uh, individual conduct rules and some of the certification stuff, for example, um, in at the same time as a new performance year and do the comms, do the comms properly up front, I think that will help enormously. Um, thinking about those sorts of, you know, how do I actually um, integrate this properly? Uh, I think getting the planning right up front is the key to a lot of this. Um, senior manager ownership, I think there's, uh, this is really about the difference between what you put down and how things really work. And I think we, you know, lots of organizations I've seen and worked in have had quite a lot of informal decision making outside of committees. Um, some of that needs to change in this world. Uh, you need at the very minimum to document who took the decisions, um, who was consulted along the way, uh, what sort of considerations, what other options were considered. Uh, it can be done quite briefly, um, but it does mitigate against those water cooler lift conversations. Um, because you need some kind of credible audit trail uh, in order to be able to satisfy those reasonable steps requirements. Um, and then I think we've probably covered the, the wood for trees one. Um, I think with this, I mean, it's the same with a lot of regulation, but with this one in particular, I think always think back to what the underlying purpose is. So don't, don't get lost in the line by line rule compliance. I think it, you always have to have in your head um, why this has come in. So why approved persons were seen not to be successful and why this is meant to be different. Um, and if you can answer that question for yourselves and for your firms, then I think you're in a much better implementation position. So we put a couple of um, short bits of collateral on um, chairs and so on, one about culture and one about um, trying to do this in a reasonably cost-effective way. Um, and we've talked, I've talked a bit about this on the way through. Uh, I think it, a lot of it does come down to having that discussion up front about how you want to come out at the end of it. Um, essentially, I think there are, four, um, there are four kind of types of compliance you can have with this. So one is the kind of day one, get you across the line. One is the business as usual one. Um, one is the, you know, what happens when things go wrong. And the fourth one is, you know, do we want to start from a blank sheet of paper? Now, I, I wouldn't recommend the, the last one unless you've got other clear reasons for doing so. Um, but I think beyond that, you know, you need to think about what we really need as a firm in order to be able to answer some of those questions um, I talked about earlier. Uh, so I think there is something about keeping certified staff small. Um, there is something about integration. Um, and we've talked a little bit as well about looking at it in a broader context. Um, I think the fourth one is, again, it's one of those things that quite often gets missed. That this is meant to be quite dynamic. So when you're thinking in particular about um, reasonable steps for senior managers, but also about conduct and competence for certified staff and so on, and about trading more generally, which you'll have to do for um, all your conduct staff in respect of the individual conduct rules, the world around us is changing all the time. So there will be new examples of um, risks um, that people have encountered, people in your sector or people in a different sector, um, but where you can see some read across.
um, the business climate will have changed. At some point, the credit cycle will turn. Um, that will create a different set of risks that a lot of people in your firm just won't have experienced before. So all the things around this need to evolve in order to reflect that changing environment. Um, and actually, I think that bit's quite healthy. I think that kind of goes beyond regulation in the kind of conventional way of looking at it. Um, but it also helps to see this regulation um, as much as possible in the context of how your firm operates normally. Um, there will be bits of it that will be inverted commas onerous and you wouldn't want to do if, you, if it was purely your choice. But there's quite a lot of fairly straightforward common sense in, in behind a lot of this. So the more of that you can integrate into how you operate going forward, the better. And here's a potential timeline. So a lot of this for me is really about Brexit um, and about the FCA's um, actual physical capacity to cope with um, something on this scale. So this is 50 plus thousand firms, something on this scale in addition to Brexit. So when the consultation paper was published back at the end of July last year, um, we were always pretty skeptical that 2018 was a realistic implementation date for the vast majority of firms. As it turns out, what they've, or what the Treasury formally has done is to uh, put in place a, an implementation for the insurers who were already subject to um, SIMR, the Senior Insurance Managers Regime. Um, which effectively means that certification for them, which is the bit of SMCR they don't currently have, that gets triggered in December this year, but they don't actually have to submit the certificates until uh, December 2019. So that's a very, very low implementation hurdle for the FCA internally to be able to, to have to meet. So I think if, we're, if we look forward on the basis of what they've said to date. I think um, we think that they will make final rules next month. Um, that's partly because the feedback they've had on the consultation, they've been very little, it's been significantly adverse, um, and they are quite keen to get it out of the way so they can, they're making the rules out of the way so they can move on to um, redeploying some people um, onto Brexit. Um, we think um, the Treasury has um, formal responsibility for announcing the implementation date. We think that will be back end of next year rather than sooner. So formally Brexit happens the end of March 2019, um, but actually with what's been said about various kind of interim periods and so on by the PRA Bank as well as the uh, FCA, I suspect there will be quite a hangover from that. And I think they'll want to create as much clear space as they think they can reasonably do. So our best bet is that we're, we're looking at October 2019. Um, I think there's potential planning period for you if you haven't started already. I know some firms have, a lot haven't. Um, so September 19, I think, is uh, this year. So that should be September 18, apologies. Um, September 2018, I think, is a reasonable time for you to have your plan in place. Um, if you have a um, December year-end, then I think there are things about introducing individual conduct rules then, um, putting in place some of the systems and so on that you're going to need for certification by the end of this year. I can, you can see the wheels turning about you know, what sort of lead time some of this might involve. Um, then you move into next year, um, and I think if you have your senior manager um, regime clear in your own heads, you've made whatever refinements or changes you need to make to responsibilities and reporting lines in order to make that fit. I think to give yourselves a six month run up uh, to the actual go live implementation date is probably reasonable. Gives you a chance to find out if anything doesn't work at that very senior level. Um, and then
and then we're back to uh, Thank you very much, Gavin. Um, I expect everybody's all ready. Um, have we got some questions? And if you could wait for the microphone um, so it'll be picked up on the podcast. Thank you. Um, could you give me some, expand a bit on the, the scope and the depth of the fit and proper assessments that uh, uh, are being looked for? Um, and and what, how they will then be um, checked on by the regulator, please. Um, so if I could answer the second bit first, I think they will take um, what firms submit at their word. Um, so I don't think they'll do any checking as such unless something really jumps out at them until and if it becomes a live issue. So I think they will expect firms to do it. Senior managers obviously is different because they will interview those people and they have to approve them individually. But for certified staff, I think they'll take firms at their word until something happens, then they'll expect it to be right. Um, I think in terms of, um, in terms of depth, uh, there's some interesting stuff. So they, um, I think they're asking for, um, in terms of senior managers, to do criminal records checks. Um, they're leaving it up to firms to decide whether to do that for certification. I don't know whether that will become a sort of de facto normal or not. I think it will be really quite interesting to see whether everyone plays safe and does them for all certified staff as well, or if they take the regulator at, at, you know, at its word. Um, I think in terms of the, the level of materiality and so on, I think that's still to some extent a, a, a sort of an area of negotiation. And I, I think there's, um, I hope the final rules will make it a bit clearer. Uh, I think there's something about having a materiality um, threshold that you're consistent about. So I think consistency is probably the biggest thing. Um, if you're clear across your firm and you apply the same standard, irrespective of how senior the person, how you've ended up recruiting them, um, you know, et cetera, you know, how much, how much money you expect them to make or is it back office? I think if you're consistent across all types of staff, you're in a much stronger position than if it's a kind of a, you know, um, it's, if it's done individually. Regarding the uh, certification regime, does the FCA plan on holding a public register of certified staff? Because obviously I think the, the approved person regime is being deprecated, senior manager yeah. is coming in, a lot of people will be falling away from the approved person into the company's hands. And do they plan on, on holding a, a public register of that information? I think they will. I think in the end they will. Um, they can't work out how to do it last I spoke to them. So it was either, um, you know, people say, you know, we hold, um, we hold details of certified staff, but actually we haven't done the certification, which is, you know, so if you, if you flip the register forward, the firms would have done the certification, not the FCA. I don't know what their appetite is for that. They certainly weren't keen originally. Or the alternative is firms publish it, um, publish their own, in which case it's very hard for people to kind of look around because it's not all in one place and it's, it's, it's hard to search. I think they're desperate too. I think they will really struggle with the fact that the new regime is somehow less than the old one. Um, so I think one way or another they'll bite a bullet. Um, but I don't, know what, I don't know what the answer is. It's one of the things they're struggling with. Um, I noticed that one of the roles for certification was uh, those involved in algorithmic trading. Does this will obviously extend through to suppliers? So sometimes a lot of the um, algorithmic expertise is in a partnership basis. So presumably, uh, in underwriting or in claims or in marketing, those um, algorithmic elements will be subject to the same level of um, monitoring as non-algorithmic. I think so. I, I mean, to be honest, I think it's one of their, um, so a lot of those um, classifications of certified staff are carried over from um, CRD4 and things like that. Um, 
they're not, but to some extent they're trying to look ahead and so on. And I think there'll be an element of kind of firms working out exactly how they do that, and then the the FCA will just have to deal with it as it goes along. So there's an element where it's, they're sort of trying to future-proof it, um, but actually how it works out in practice is less clear. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Gavin. You're welcome. Um, thank you to Grant Thornton for. Um, hosting this. I expect you'll be around for a little while afterwards yes, if anyone's got any questions. Um, um, we will be sending out feedback forms electronically. If you could complete those, it literally only takes a moment. That's very helpful. And it helps us with our CII CPD accreditation, so we need to keep that going. Um, looking at upcoming events, uh, Wednesday 20th of June, Moore Stevens are hosting a briefing on how to increase your business by using insurer hosting. I think it's insurer hosted data. Um, Monday 25th of June, CMS are hosting a Brexit briefing. And Thursday the 12th of July, as I hope everybody knows, is our annual conference. And if you haven't registered yet, please do so. Um, once again, I'd like to thank Gavin and in the usual Very well. way. Mm -hmm.